two conversations. Questions one to five are based on the following conversation. The answer should be appropriate to the content of this conversation. Oh, hi, Dave. Long time no see. Hi, Maria. I just settled down. I thought I'd drop by. Come on in. Take a seat. Would you like anything to drink? I have Sprite and orange juice. Sprite would be fine. Oh, so how have you been? Oh, not bad. And you? Oh, I'm doing okay. But school has been really busy these days, and I haven't had time to relax.、Mm, by the way, what's your major? Hotel management. Well. What do you want to do once you graduate?、Um, I haven't decided for sure, but I think I'd like to work for a hotel or travel agency in this area. How about you? Well, when I first started college, I wanted to major in French, but I realised I might have a hard time finding a job using the language, so I changed my major to computer science. With the right skills, landing a job in the computer industry shouldn't be too difficult. So, do you have a part-time job to support yourself through school? Well, fortunately for me, I received a four-year academic scholarship that pays for all of my tuition and books. Wow, that's great! Yeah, how about you? Are you working your way through school? Yeah, I work three times a week at a restaurant near campus. Oh, what do you do there? I'm a cook. How do you like your job? It's okay. The other workers are friendly, and the pay isn't bad. Now you have a chance to read questions six to ten, and then answer questions six to ten according to the conversation. Several days later, Dave and Maria met on campus. So, what do you want to do tomorrow? Well, let's look at this city guide here. Um, here's something interesting. Why don't we first visit the art museum in the morning? Okay, I like that idea. And、um, where do you want to have lunch? How about going to an Indian restaurant? The guide recommends one downtown, a few blocks from the museum. Now that sounds great. After that, what do you think about visiting the zoo? Well, it says here that there are some very unique animals not found anywhere else. Well, to tell the truth, I'm not really interested in going there. Yeah, why don't we go shopping instead? There are supposed to be some really nice places to pick up souvenirs. No, I don't think that's a good idea. We only have a few travelers' checks left, and I only have fifty dollars left in cash. No problem. We can use your credit card to pay for my clothes. Oh no! I remember the last time you used my credit card for your purchases. Oh well. Let's take the subway down to the seashore and walk along the beach. Now that sounds like a wonderful plan. That is the end of section one. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. You are going to hear part of a lecture on some useful information for your travelling around Britain. Listen to the lecture and complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the space provided. Good afternoon, and welcome to the session on Britain. This afternoon, I would like to provide some useful information for you about travelling around Britain. 
Britain has over 700 tourist information centres. You will find them at major ports, airports, stations, historic landmarks and towns, and holiday centres. So just look out for this sign that says Tourist Information. The staff will be able to answer your holiday queries, as well as provide essential maps, guides and brochures. Tourist information centres at major ports and airports in London and addresses of British Tourist Authority European offices are all listed on the tourist information centres. Now, let's talk about the telephone in Britain. You know, Britain is well supplied with public telephones. Street kiosks take lop coins. In city centres, mainline railway stations, airports and central London underground stations. Payphones and card phones are in operation. For the latter, small plastic phone cards are used and these come in 10, 20, 40, 100 and 200 units and can be bought at post offices, news kiosks, station bars and shops where the green and white card phone sign is displayed. When using the different public telephone systems, make sure you read the dialing instructions carefully. Now let's see the banks in Britain. There are 24-hour banks at London's two main airports. One is Heathrow and the other is Gatwick. Otherwise, banks are normally open from 9.30 to 3.30, Monday to Friday. Barclays Bank and National Westminster Bank offer a Saturday morning service at some of their branches. National Gyra Banks has 42 bureaux de change located in post offices throughout the country in main tourist areas. Opening hours are 9 to 5.30 weekdays, 9 to 12.30 Saturday mornings. One exception to this is the Trafalgar Square office, whose opening hours are 8 to 8 weekdays and Saturdays, and 10 to 5 on Sundays. The bureau de change services are available to overseas visitors. Visitors can change their money there. You can also change money at Bureau de Change, large hotels, department stores and travel agents. Be sure to check in advance the rate of exchange and the commission charged, as these vary considerably. Wherever possible, you are advised to use the bank or Bureau de Change, which conforms to the BTA Code of Conduct. In most cases, this is indicated by display of the code. That is the end of section 2. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear an interview with Dr. Simons. Now you have some time to read questions 21 to 30. As you listen, complete the sentences by writing no more than three words for each answer. Well, as I said, there were three areas of interest, so perhaps we should take each in turn. Fine. Let's take the medical and physical evidence first. Hmm. Well, first of all, life expectancy. Although some very old individuals were encountered, the Ramesses is a case in point. He was probably over 90. It seemed the average Egyptian died rather young, from about 30 to 35 years old, on the whole. Although the nobility, as might be expected, tended to live longer. Some of them have been found to be 50 or 60 years old. Well, naturally, the older they got, the more medical problems were encountered. 
but some modern disorders have so far not been found. There is no evidence yet of any malignant tumours, for example, although the fact that most people studied were comparatively young could account for this. Another modern problem, dental decay, was also absent, probably due to the plain diet and absence of sugar. There was another problem with teeth caused by this diet. The stones on which their flour was ground caused a lot of grit to get into the bread, and this eroded the teeth, so much that many older people must have suffered greatly and could have been confined to a liquid diet. An abscess on the jaw caused by this kind of erosion may in fact have contributed to the death of Ramesses II. Analysis of the internal organs of several mummies has revealed that intestinal parasites were common, even among the upper classes. Evidence of a generally low standard of public hygiene and another widespread disorder was a form of anemia. Naturally, the ancient Egyptians didn't smoke, but uh, lesions on the lung were widespread. These, however, are the sort that we associate today with workers in mines and quarries, and must be due, in the case of Egyptians, to living in sandy desert conditions. Actually, on the smoking issue, there was a temporary sensation when traces of what appeared to be tobacco were found in Ramesses' sarcophagus, but uh, botanists later confirmed that it was not in fact tobacco itself, but a related plant which is native to Egypt. In the meantime, cynics were commenting that it probably had come from the cigarette of some careless Egyptologist or museum attendant of the past. Ha ha! And what about their physical appearance? Well, what would you expect from seeing Egyptian art? They were light and slight in build. The average height for both men and women was about 1 metre 60, and um, studies of the skeletons from which the covering of flesh can be extrapolated suggest that they weighed much less in relation to their height than most modern people. From about 10 to 15 kilograms, Less than someone of a similar height today is the estimate. And what about mummification? Ah, uh, well, the first thing to be said is that it wasn't always done in the same way, and it was by no means infallible, as many people tend to think. Many bodies, including that of the famous King Tutankhamun, were also entirely destroyed by overuse of one or another of the substances generally employed. The basic procedure was much the same, however. Most of the internal organs, including the brain, were removed and preserved separately in a jar. The brain was got out through the nose using a sort of hook. Oh, dear. Yes. It used to be thought that the heart was always removed too. But in the case of Ramesses, it was found in place. The body was then immersed in a substance called natron. That's a form of sodium carbonate, which occurred naturally in Egypt, for 40 to 70 days. It was then washed, made up and wrapped in linen bandages and placed in its coffin or sarcophagus. Then it was soaked in oils, resins and perfumes to help preserve it further. You said the body was made up. Do you mean its face was painted? Yes, yes. Ramesses was not only made up, they had to restructure his nose, which was damaged when they took out his brain. The investigators found that it had been stuffed with small animal bones and uh, peppercorns, of all things. His hair had been dyed too. You said that Ramesses had suffered other adventures after his death? Ah, well, yes. Poor chap. Well, for a start, he was found in a much later tomb than his real date. Along with a lot of other pharaohs, it looks very much as if the priests of later times had moved and reburied him to save him from tomb robbers. His body was transported, along with the other pharaohs found in the same tomb, to the Cairo Museum. That was in 1871, and it was put on display. Well, naturally, removed from the dry desert atmosphere, his body started to deteriorate, and by the 1970s was in very poor state. That was part of the reason why the Egyptian authorities gave their consent for its temporary removal to Paris for study. Yet another upheaval. The French experts aimed not only to carry out an investigation, but were also able to apply the latest techniques of restoration and conservation, so that at the end of the study, Ramesses was specially treated and then rewrapped in new bandages. Well, they weren't exactly new, since they were of ancient Egyptian date given a new sarcophagus 
and carefully transported back to Cairo, where he is now kept in a controlled environment, which should slow down the deterioration process. So, as I said at the beginning, not only was science served, but a proper respect was paid to the remains in the end. Exactly. That is the end of section three. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. In this section, you will hear a report about crime and punishment in the UK. First, read questions 31 to 40. Listen to the report and answer questions 31 to 40. Like many other countries, Britain has experienced a great increase in criminal activity of nearly every kind. Nearly five times as many acts of violence were reported to the police in 1997 as 20 years before. Although most burglars are not caught, those who are caught overload the courts and prisons. Although the courts try, in theory at least, to use probation, community service and other devices to avoid sentencing people to prison. The 50,000 people in prison are more in proportion to the population than in any other Western European countries. Vast sums are being spent on building new prisons, but the prisons are still overcrowded and the humiliation suffered by their inmates makes rehabilitation difficult. Many prisoners are released early on parole. The prisons in England are run by the Home Office, though each prison has a local board of visitors who make reports about conditions and also deal with serious bad behaviour. Normally prisoners are released after serving two-thirds or less of the time for which they were sentenced, but an offence in prison may be punished by the loss of some days of remission. There are several kinds of prisons, including open ones, and some prisoners go out to work in groups outside. Prisoners who want to study for examinations are helped to do so, and there are training courses in prisons. But in practice, some spend little time outside their cells. Most crime is committed by young males, and is opportunist and is not planned by hardened professional criminals although these do exist in most common people's view. Crime tends to be concentrated in large cities and urban areas. About 94% of offences recorded by the police in England and Wales are directed against property, but only 5% involve violence. Rising affluence has provided more opportunities for casual property crime. In 1977, for example, car crime was only one-tenth of total crime but this has risen to about 28%. The demand for and supply of illegal drugs had been an increasing factor in the incidence of crime in recent years. Regular crime surveys are undertaken in England and Wales, Scotland and in Northern Ireland. In 1999, a survey in England and Wales asked respondents for information about how crime had affected them in 1998. It estimated a total of 15 million crimes in 1998, the majority of which were against property. Violent crime accounted for only 5% of the total, while 36% involved vehicles, 9% were burglaries, and 30% other forms of theft. These surveys, the fifth of which is in progress, indicate that many crimes go unrecorded by the police, mainly because not all victims report them. That is the end of section 4. You will have half a minute to check your answers.